Hello and welcome to Greece Public Library's Book Break. I am Kirstra. I'm one of the librarians here. I moderate the Pints and Prose Book Discussion Group and I am joined as always by my colleague Claire. Hello everyone. I moderate As the Page Turns and also our historical group on Facebook. Awesome. So welcome. Um, today we are going to bring you just another roundup of what we've been reading. Um, because our next book break is actually going to be on St. Patrick's Day, and I think we're going to do a little bit of a St. Patty's Day theme for that. So we're just going to get through a bunch of books today and let you all know what we've been reading. Uh, Claire, do you want to start? Sure. Um, I, If I have a theme, it was I just tried to pinpoint things that I've been reading for the challenge. So nice. each one of my books qualifies. So mm -hmm. there you go if you're doing our challenge. The first one is called The Kindest Lie by Nancy Johnson, um, qualifies as woman of color, author of color. Um, this was my book of the month, mother daughter choice um, that my daughter and I did last month. And it was interesting because it's, um, it feels historical even though it wasn't that long ago. Um, mm. It was set in 2008. Barack Obama has just been elected and our main characters are Ruth Tuttle and her husband, Xavier, and they are celebrating with their friends in their Chicago neighborhood. Um, having hope for the future, Xavier finally decides to kind of question Ruth about when they could begin to start their family. Mm -hmm. And Ruth drops a big secret. Um, that she had a baby as a teenager that she gave up for adoption. And she just doesn't know how she feels about it. And she feels like she needs to reconcile that part of her past before she moves forward. So of course this causes kind of a problem in their marriage, but Ruth decides to go home to Indiana and she finds her hometown a shamble and a shadow of its former shelf. Um, the, the plant where her brother and many of the men in the town worked has been closed. Um, it's plagued by unemployment, racism, and despair. Uh, people mm. are just not in a good place. So she starts digging for the secrets of what happens to her child because her mother and brother insisted on secrecy. Um, mm. So she really tried like official channels, couldn't find anything. So she begins her own search onto what happened on that fateful day 11 years ago. Um, along the way in the town, she befriends a very troubled young white boy who calls himself Midnight, um, whose own mother has passed away, father has been unemployed, has major issues, and grandmother has him now, who happens to be friends with um, Ruth's mother. So those two ladies are friends, hence the connection. Um, so a lot of people in the town are not happy about her looking for these secrets um, and revisiting her past, particularly her mother and brother who made many personal sacrifices for what they felt was her successful future. Um, Ruth actually went to Yale. She became a um, engineer. She has a good job in Chicago, and they kind of want to just leave the past in the past. Um, but when Ruth ends up finding out who her son is and where he's been placed with, there are ramifications for everyone, including the young boy that she's befriended, who um, I don't want to give too much of it away, but there is kind of like a big shocking thing at the end. Um, but even with that, the novel does end on a hopeful note. Um, Ruth and her husband do come to some kind of agreement, um, but there's a lot of realistic themes in the story. I mean, I felt like mm -hmm. it was very, very believable, um, everything that could have happened. So, you know, a good book to read, you know, for a lot of modern themes, it would make mm -hmm. a great book club choice, The Kindest Lie. Nice. I know you love a family drama. <laughs> Oh, I love them fam and family <laughs> secrets, you know? Yes. Yeah, yeah it's very compelling. Yeah. Nice. That sounds good. Um, my first book is, well, I'm just going to dive. So it's The Push by Ashley Audrain. 
Um, this one has been getting a ton of buzz. It's um, a Good Morning America book club pick. Oh. Um, it's got blurbs from Kristen Hanna and Lisa Jewell, like some really high profile um, folks are getting behind this book. And the author used to work in publishing before she wrote this book. So before she became an author herself. Um, so this one, it's um, got very similar themes to Baby Teeth, which was our first Grace Reads book last year by Zoya Stage. Um, so there, our main character is Blythe Connor. Um, she is a young woman um, who comes from sort of a troubled past um, and she's made a life, she's married and she is starting a family. And um, her daughter, Violet, um, there's kind of an ongoing question of whether um, there is something wrong with Violet or whether there's kind of something wrong with Blythe. Like the two don't really have um, very much of an emotional connection. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the book is exploring that and whether it's, you know, again, something wrong with Blythe or if there's something wrong with Violet. Um, so that is very similar in a lot of ways to Baby Teeth. Um, I thought that Baby Teeth was the better book of the two. Um, I really kind of found myself wanting this one to be more like Baby Teeth, which is probably not the best way to go into reading a book, but they're just so similar. Similar, I really couldn't help comparing them. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the big differences I think is that the push is told entirely from Blythe's, from the mother's perspective, whereas in Baby Teeth, we get the mother and the daughter. Um, while still maintaining a lot of ambiguity about what exactly is going on, you do get that shift in perspective, which I think makes it a deeper book in a mm -hmm. lot of ways. Yeah. Um, and there's, I don't want to spoil anything, um, but there are a couple of central decisions that the main character makes in this one that I found unbelievable that kind of took me out of the story. Like, really like all of this is going on and this is your decision i i just i didn't buy it yeah. so that being said um we have a a colleague who read this one and really liked it so as always your mileage may vary and i would love to hear from anyone else who has read both books to see whether it was just me yeah um but my personal recommendation would be if you're looking for kind of a twisty psychological read about like the ambiguities of motherhood, go for Baby Teeth by Zoya Stage. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I read that premise of that book because like mm -hmm. you said, it's been getting a lot of buzz. Is it a debut <clears throat> novel? Uh, I believe that it is, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I just thought, huh, this sounds just like Baby Teeth, mm -hmm. but um yeah so my second one since we're on twisty <laughs> psychological thrillers uh is people like her by ellery lloyd um this one i put in my challenge as a um book involving social media mm -hmm. because uh we have a story of emmy jackson who is across the pond um and she has found her niche as at the mama bear uh, mm -hmm. a high program, high profile social media influencer on Instagram. Um, she has hundreds of thousands of followers and her, her stick is um, she bears all of her mom moments with her and her children in all honesty. Um, and the funny thing is, is uh, it's written in alternating chapters between her and her husband and then mm -hmm. this mystery person who starts popping up who obviously has mal intent to harm oh. her and her family. Um, but the, the first chapter from her husband is uh, like full, you know what? So she, <laughs> she is not, um, it really is very eye opening in the mm -hmm. world of these influencers who, you know, look so natural and, you know, everything is staged. Like her, her photo shoots are done weeks ahead of time. The, 
the posts are all planned. And um, the funny thing is, is she's trying to relate to, she has found through research, because she used to work in the magazine industry before mm. she was laid off, um, that in Britain, they don't want the perfect mum. They want a mum that can relate to uh, their problems. So she's mm -hmm. kept on a few pounds, even though it bugs her. She actually has the house messed up before some of the shoots <gasps> because it's it, it doesn't look like that in real life. To make um, it authentic? Yes, yes, you know, <laughs> puts on the wrong color sneaker, like one shoe, you know, it, it's very contrived. Um, so it, it's it's funny because Dan was a successful author. Okay, now he's really struggling because he hasn't written anything in years. His editors are losing interest. Meanwhile, his wife's popularity is skyrocketing and she's sprung off into all these springboards for advertising products and having these this must have been pre-covid you know open houses where people come and talk to her and of course they pay a fee and they get goodie bags and um, so meanwhile this this voice keeps ramping up and you know there's a reason why this person hates emmy and you gradually start to find that out and why she's planning on taking revenge and how she's planning on taking mm -hmm. revenge which is a little outlandish, but you know, it's a thriller and you, and you go with it. Um, the saddest part for me in this book is um, there's one storyline where she, she really screws her best friend. There's just no other mm -hmm. way to have it. She's, she's become such a superficial person that um, she tells a story that isn't hers to tell and um, kind of manufactures it as her own. And um, the only other thing I can say is for people that may have had like infertility or like loss of child, this book may be triggering because mm. you, you honestly get, it kind of reminded me of Gone Girl in a way where I got okay. to the point where I hated both of the parents so much. It was like, let her kill you. I hope that kids leave and get placed somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> you know, not quite that bad, but you're just like, oh, really? Really? Mm. And it is kind of a, a testament to our society as to what we think is good, why we follow certain people, and what happens to those people when all this fame takes place. So um, it wasn't my favorite book by any, but, okay. I, uh, but I thought there were a lot of lessons learned and it was interesting. Sure. But I can't yeah. say I really hmm. love the characters. Yeah. Well, and I mean, I think that's that's something that we all sort of need to reckon with is the fact that, um, you know, all of these, you know, your Instagram life is curated. It's not your real life. Like, not anyone. Like, the stuff I choose to post on my Instagram, like, I post pictures of when my dogs are being cute, not when they pooped in the kitchen. <laughs> I have to clean it up, you know? Yeah. Like, so, yeah. No, that's interesting, though. Yeah. Nice. I was all ready to add it to my list, and then you were like, eh, I kind of hated everyone. And I was like, well, maybe I can give that one a skip. <laughs> Um, oh, and I should mention, sorry, I forgot to say for the push, uh, this is a book published in 2021. So you can check that off of your list for the challenge. Sorry. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Um, my next book is If Beale Street Could Talk by James Baldwin. Um, this one, so we have it in the teen section. So it would work for teen or middle grade book. It is author of color. And it's been made into a movie. So many different categories you could check off with this one. Um, this is the first of James Baldwin's fiction that I've read. Um, I saw there's a phenomenal documentary um, about him that came out a couple of years ago called I Am Not Your Negro. Mm -hmm. um, and I would recommend everyone to watch that documentary. It is extremely powerful. Um, so I knew a lot of his sort of personal politics going into the book, but I hadn't read his fiction. Um, and this one was published in 1974 um, after he had moved to France, um, but it is set in New York 
um, in that current day, so in the early 70s. Um, and this book is about, it's really a love story and a family drama. Um, and the main characters are Tish and Fani. Um, they were childhood friends growing up in Harlem. Um, and in their early teens, they realize that they have also fallen in love. So at the beginning of the book, um, they are in love, they are engaged to be married, and Tish is pregnant. Um, and we find out very soon, or really right at the beginning, that Fani is in jail. Um, and we don't find out why for a long time, um, but we do get hints both that it's for a pretty serious crime and also that um, we're pretty sure he did not do it. Um, and over the course of the book, and it's a fairly short book, um, you kind of learn more and more about what actually happened, why Fani ended up in jail, um, and sort of the meat of the story, such as it is, is Tish and her family working to try and find a way to get Fani out of jail before Tish's baby is born. Um, but you get a lot of flashbacks too, to Tish and Fani growing up and sort of how their family dynamics work. Um, so you get a lot of um, black life in New York in the 60s and 70s. Um, and it is not always a happy book. In fact, a lot of it is not happy. Um, it's a love story, but it's a love story in the face of injustice. Um, so parts of it are very sweet and very beautiful. Um, Tish and Fani have really a very, um, a very strong relationship. Um, but the world that they live in is just kind of brutal. Mm -hmm. Um, so you see the two of them, um, how hard it is for them to sort of navigate their relationship in the wider context of this world that is just so brutal. Um, so it's not, you know, a super uplifting book, but it is beautifully written and there's some really um, lovely stuff in there about Tish and Fani's relationship. Um, and I would highly recommend it. Okay. And there is a movie that came out like two years ago that yeah, I haven't I seen yet. I bought that new edition with the movie. I yeah. Think, you know, so. Yeah. So I'm definitely gonna um, gonna borrow that and watch it. Good. I'm excited to see it. Yeah, he's been on my list as well, mm -hmm. um, but I have not read that or or his others. So yeah. Hopefully it's a this quick year. read. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, my last one. Um, it's a trifecta mm. for the challenge, Pal uh, published in 2021, which I believe my other two were as well, um, set in the 1920s, ah. um, and a historical fiction that is not World War II. It's mm -hmm. The Mystery of Mrs. Christie by Marie Benedict. And um, Marie Benedict tends to write about women in history that have made pretty prominent contributions that have kind of been overlooked. Um, mm. I like her historical fiction because I feel she really does her job with the research and the books that I've read of hers, even though they are fictionalized, I feel like that could have actually happened. You know, um, it's believable to me where some of mm -hmm. them are just so like, what? Outlandish, you know? <laughs> um, so anyway, um, I did not realize that Agatha Christie had a mysterious disappearance for 11 days mm -hmm. in her own life. Um, and she never revealed anything about that time, um, even in her own autobiography. So it, this is uh, Marie Benedict's job of constructing what might have happened during that time. And it's based on known facts about Agatha. So mm -hmm. the novel is written from two perspectives. Um, it's the manuscript, which Agatha is writing about her life with her husband, Archie, and then Archie's, um, Archie's take on the, the disappearance, mm -hmm. like day by day by day. Um, so they start out, Agatha is just swept away by Archie at a society dance, um, even though she has been 
promised or engaged to another man. He, Archie pursues Agatha relentlessly and they end up marrying during the First World War. Um, she feels he comes home a changed man and the charming, easy to please man that she fell in love with is nowhere to be found. Um, we learn about her family relationships, including the closeness with her mother because her own father had died. Um, they were not in good financial straits. So even though she came from a, a well-to-do family, um, her marriage was important. Mm. Um, so her mother taught her, I think her mother and sister, neither one of them liked Archie from the get-go. Uh, <laughs> good vibes, mom. Mm. But anyway, of course she, she didn't listen. And um, her mom just kept saying she had to put his needs first. You know, I think she knew he would be a wanderer. But um, so she put her his needs before everything else. It's amazing to me what she accomplished because, you know, they weren't uber wealthy. So she did all the like cooking, most of the cleaning, um, she wrote, she had one daughter, uh, she pretty much did it all. Um, mm. That old bring it, you know, I bring home the bacon, fry it up in the pan ad. Um, but the thing is, is it doesn't bode well for her. So Archie, of mm. course, does stray. He is engaged to another woman. Um, and that was the one thing that was really funny to me is <laughs> he drops, you know, this, this bomb revelation and then Agatha disappears. So part mm -hmm. of it is he was left a letter with distinct instructions on what to do. And you're finding out as, as it progresses what she, what she wants. So to me, it was very enjoyable. It took a lot of Agatha Christie's background. You find out like little tidbits about her, which were true. Like she learned to surf. Um, she learned a lot about poisons when she worked in medical dispensary in World War I. Um, it didn't disappoint. Um, it kind of took a little bit to get going, but um, I thought it was very good and very well constructed um, and recommended for anybody that likes historical fiction or Agatha Thanks. Christie, too. Yeah. I was a huge um, Agatha Christie nerd in high school. I read like all of her books that I could get my hands on. So I'm going to have to pick that one up, I think. I haven't read any other of Marie Benedict's books, but she's um, the the one about Clementine, Lady Clementine, right? I read Lady Clementine, which was good, and also the other Einstein, which right. was about Einstein's wife. Mm -hmm. um, she wrote Carnegie's Maid, which I haven't read. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the one so, about Hedy Lamarr. Yes, yes, I, I want to read yeah, that one too. The Lady lady Scientist? Yes, the only other woman in the room, I think. Oh. But this one is available too. I want to bring up on mm -hmm. Hoopla as an oh, e nice. As are all of Agatha Christie's books. They're both oh. on ebook and audio um, on Hoopla. So I did not know that. Yeah. Nice. I'm gonna have to check that out. Very cool. Um, my last book is *The Starless Sea* by Aaron Morgan Stern. Um, Aaron Morgan Stern's debut book was The Night Circus, uh, which I read many years ago and just loved, 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 loved. And it's been, I think it was like eight years in between that book and when this one was published. Um, they are not related at all, um, but I loved The Night Circus so much. I was like, I must read the new Aaron Morgan Stern. Um, and I really liked this book. Um, it is probably not for everyone. Um, it's very meta in a lot of ways. Like it is a like 500 page book about stories. It is a story about stories. So there's a lot of like meta stuff in there. It name checks um, the shadow of the wind and if on a winter's night a traveler, which if you've read either of those is going to get you kind of in the right mindset yeah. for this one. Um, so we do have a main character. He's Zachary Ezra Keats. Um, and he's kind of our person that we follow through the whole book. Um, but the Starless Sea is a reference to um, this sort of idea or myth or fairy tale about um, kind of a hidden place 
below the surface of the world, so underground, where um, there is almost like a kind of magical library. It is just a space full of stories and lots of different kinds of stories. So there are books, but there are also paintings that tell a story and, you know, mosaics and art and all kinds of things. And in the center of it all is this starless sea that is sort of the font of inspiration for these stories. Um, and if you're very lucky, you might find a door that takes you to the starless sea. Um, so that's kind of our our overarching theme, but then there are lots of other stories within the story, um, some of which connect to characters that we actually meet, some of which are just stories or fragments of stories. Um, so the one uh, thing that I will say about this book is it took me probably about halfway through to really sort of get a grip on what was happening. Um, so she starts lots of little fragments of story and they do the threads do pull together to make a picture, but it takes a while. Mm -hmm. um, and I was willing to give her that sort of leeway. I gave it some extra patience because I trusted her from her previous book to like be going somewhere with it, right. but I could easily see how um, it could be frustrating or confusing um, if that's not your jam, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but by about halfway through, things start to pull together and you kind of get a sense of where the story is going. And then it's just like a, a tumble to the end. Um, and I read probably the last 200 pages in one sitting, like frantically turning pages. Um, but it's it's a lovely book. The writing is absolutely gorgeous um, and fun and funny. Um, but again, lots of metaphor and references to other books and um, kind of abstract thinking about stories and storytelling. So like I said, probably not for everyone, but if that sounds like your jam, I I could not recommend this enough. Oh, I might have to read that because I also love the Night Circus, mm -hmm. and I love the Shadow of the In the Shadow of the Wind. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah. So you would probably like this. And like I said, give it give it some patience. Mm -hmm. It takes a while for me, at least. It took a while to really pick up and to be able to kind of sort out in your mind where everything was going. But yeah. once you start to get that picture, um, it, it moves. Mm -hmm. So. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so that's what we got. Um, I don't think, I don't think that this one, unfortunately, um, will check any boxes in the reading challenge. I'd have to go back and look, um, but it's still um, but we have lots of other options here. Um, we have had a few people coming in um, and asking for recommendations or help finding books to fit certain categories in the challenge. And we love that. <laughs> like, I love helping people find a book. I know Claire does too. Yeah. Um, and we're always available to help with that. So if you're participating in the challenge and you need a little bit of help finding another book, please do ask us. Um, and we've still got plenty of time. We've still got three months left in the challenge. So there's more than enough time to start, even if you haven't started yet, or um, you know, to hit your goal, whatever your goal might be for that challenge. Yeah, I'm really enjoying it. You know, Me too. I like the variety. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. Um, last year, I think I, I mentioned in our year end wrap up, it was like the year of fantasy for me, which is great and I love it, but this year I'm definitely like <laughs> reading in some some more different categories, which is probably good. Yeah. So yeah. All, All right. right. And we will be back in two weeks on St. Patrick's Day. Um and hopefully we'll have some some good stuff for you yeah. for that. Um and until then please drop us a comments in or drop us a comment if you have read any of the books that we've talked about, if you have suggestions for us, 
um, let us know how you're doing with the challenge if you're participating in the challenge. Um, and we will see you in a couple of weeks. Yep. Take care. All right. Thanks, everybody. Happy reading. Happy reading. <laughs>